Well, welcome to the 700 Club Canada. James, it's been a great week to have you here with us. Uh, I just love your heart so much and what God's doing in your life. Yeah, you know? thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here and be able to share like some of the amazing things that God is doing in this time right now. Yeah, exactly. And you know, today we're gonna talk about being transformed by God. So let me tell you something that happened in my life that transformed me, James. And you know, my son, Curtis, and yeah. sometimes your kids teach you things. <laughs> a lot of times they do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know, he was really one that got me back into this regular practice of wherever I go, being open to pray with people, to share the gospel with people. It's truly changed my life, James. I do life differently because of it. Mm. And I'm seeing God at work all around me. Like, because when you're ready and looking and you're willing to participate, it's just amazing how obvious it is, right? Yeah. What, what about you? What's transformed you? Like, how has God transformed yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, same type of thing. Like, watching God move and using me to share the gospel or the good news with people, I was at the dog park not long ago and just, I saw this lady and she had uh, two dogs very similar to my dog, right? Really rowdy and energetic, right? Rowdy and energetic. <laughs> and you know, we got talking and yeah. she was really sad. And so I was just like, oh, what happened? And she, one of her dogs had died. And so she was really upset, right? Yeah. And so I just, I heard the Lord speak to me in my heart, just saying, pray for her. Mm. I was like, oh man, I was nervous at first, but I was like, you know what? Okay. And so I prayed with her that God's peace would be upon her. Yeah. And you know what? She ended up coming to know the Lord. Wow. Yeah, so it's just amazing that yeah. God would use me in that way at yeah. a dog park. You know? Right? Yeah. But you know, I love that like you paid attention to the prompting and I love your honesty though to say, I felt uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable most of the most days of my life, like honestly, yeah. you, you know, you might be watching and think we know how to do this. We're the professional, you know, people that share their face. That's not true. We're just like you. And we have learned to step out of our comfort zone and do what God's asked us to do. And that's our encouragement to you today, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is how one promise to God changed Michael's life forever. He, he dragged her into the, the kitchen by her hair and he, uh, he, Pulled out the gun, he put it to her head and he cocked it and he said, tell him the truth. She looks at me and she says, he's, he's not your father, you're not his son. Michael Ford spent much of his youth fearing the man he thought was his father. He used to verbally abuse me as much as he did physically. He would tell me that, you know, nobody loves me, nobody wants me. I'd be better off dead, I'd be better off running away. He would always tell her, well, you know, what about that SOB that shouldn't be here right now? He shouldn't be in my house. You grow up as a kid, regardless of your parents' flaws, your parents are your heroes, you know? But when you find out that this man that isn't your father, then who are you as a person? Both of his parents were alcoholics. She would, you know, get drunk and, and cry, um, lock herself in a room, and she would get drunk and, and smash things and shoot his guns off and beat up on me and my mom. When Michael was 15, his mother went to prison after she killed someone while driving drunk. It, it broke me. My mom was the, the best person I knew, regardless of the flaws that she did have. And for them to, to throw the book at her like that, it took my hope. Michael went to live with relatives until he finished high school. Then they told him he was on his own. And they tell me, look, you know, you graduated high school now. We did what we had to do. We got you through whatever you need to go through. Get a job, do something. You know, don't come back home. Once again, being rejected, neglected by somebody else. I ended up at the, the homeless shelter here in San Antonio. And I remember my first night there, man, I cried. And the only thought that was going through my head was, where, where is everybody? That I was alone, by myself, homeless. I decided then, like, it's just me. Whatever I got to do for me, that's what I got to do. Michael turned to gangs for protection and survival. Gang life was glorified. I wasn't accepted at school, I wasn't accepted by my dad, but if I joined this, I could be accepted by something. Michael also started stealing. There's a lot of people who get social security checks, welfare checks, in the beginning of the month. They'll go cash out these checks and be walking around with all that money on them. And we beat them up and we take the cash and, and live off of that. Eventually, Michael was arrested. So I had the, the thought that I was gonna get out of jail and I was gonna get a job, I was gonna you know, go back to school, whatever. 
Shortly after that, however, Michael's best friend's girlfriend was robbed. The two of them set out to settle the score. He gives me a knife, really big knife. Mind you, at the same time, I have like $120 worth of crack on me. We see a cop driving towards us. So we decided to cut through the nearest parking lot. And I guess that was enough, that was enough initiative for him. And he just, he kind of like swerved around us, cut us off, boom. Threw me across the hood, checked me, I had the crack on me, I had the knife on me. Michael began to envision life in prison. The very first thought that came to my mind is like, yo, they threw the book at your mom. She had never had trouble with the law before, and they threw the book at her. So imagine what they're going to do to you. You got arrested. Something in my, in my spirit said, pray. So I prayed, and I said, God, God, please, if you get me out of this situation, I'll give my life to you. But he was shocked at what happened next. He was like, you're way too young to be getting in all this trouble. I was like, well, what do you want to do with your life? Oh, I want to go to school. I, I started making, I'm, I'm just being honest. I, I started saying the best stuff I could say to me, give this man a good impression about me. <laughs> I started telling him all types of stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to college. Finally, he just said, look, man, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you go. And if I ever see you on this block again, it doesn't matter if you're going to the store to get a bag of chips. He said, I'm going to lock you up for possession charges. The next night, Michael met a young man doing street evangelism. And he's like, I'm from the Joshua house. He's like, oh, you know, we're out here to let people know that Jesus loves you. And, and, and there's, there's nothing you could ever do to separate yourself from God's love. It doesn't matter what kind of life you're living right now. Jesus loves you just the way you are. You come just as you are. And I just heard the voice of God. And he said, you told me you were going to give me your life. Stop what you're doing. Go with these people, because this is where I want you to be. As soon as I heard that, I looked at him. I said, let's do it. Let's go. I'm ready. Let's go. Michael began attending a church in San Antonio and entered a group home where he was cared for and discipled. What really threw me off was the love. People I had never met before hugging me and you know, telling me that they love me, Jesus loves me. It was the first time in my life that I had felt peace that I felt hope. It was the first time in my life that I've actually felt like I had a home. I learned what it means to love God, to love others, to know God, to serve God. I haven't looked back since. Today, Michael is married to Maria and shares his musical gifts at church and in the streets of San Antonio. He's also the director of the same group home that he attended. If somebody didn't love me, uh, when I wasn't worthy of love, then I wouldn't be who I am today. God has called me to go and show others of his love. My purpose in life is to worship God, period. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, in which you have been called out of the depths of darkness into his glorious light to declare his praise. Our job as Christians is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ in everything that we do, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with all of our hope. Our job as Christians is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. I love how Michael said that. And it's so true. How could we keep from singing his praise once we experience the tangible love of God that reaches out to us even in the deepest, darkest places of our lives? You see, Michael Ford was a man on a mission to seek and to get what he wanted when he wanted it, and often at the expense of other people. And you know what? This pursuit landed him in prison. But the love of God that saw past that toughness, that rough outer shell into Michael's heart really captivated him, a heart that, was ex that experienced deep rejection and disapproval at a young age. The amazing love of God was poured out over Michael while in prison, and he experienced true love, true belonging, and true sonship in Christ Jesus. A powerful testimony. There is no distance too far for God to reach. And there is never a time too late for God to show you his love and his mercy. Listen, friends, God loves you and will meet you there where you are at. If you turn to him, turn away from your brokenness and the empty pursuits of this life and turn to him, he will transform your life. You know, maybe you are watching this right now and it 
it seemed like an accident that you stumbled upon this channel. Well, let me tell you, it wasn't an accident. God wants you. He wants you to look to him and discover that he is your greatest treasure. God wants you to discover that he is your greatest friend and that he is your greatest provider and that he is your greatest love. God wants you to experience that in your life. Listen, if that is speaking to you today, I want you to pick up the phone and give us a call 1-855-759-0700. And we want to give you this resource, A New Day, to help you on your journey of discovering more about God and His plan for you. Up next, Laura uncovers the truth about God and who she was created to be. We at the 700 Club Canada believe in answered prayer, and so we want to pray for you. Write your prayer request on the back of the ornament in your mailing and return it, or submit your prayer request by going to 700club.ca. We'll display the prayer requests on our Tree of Hope. It's our joy to pray for you and your needs during this Christmas season. As a little girl, I was uh, full of energy. I was very hyper, I was very athletic. I had a, a really hard relationship with my mom. My mom was very quiet, and my mom was much closer to my brother that was the very quiet, obedient child. And so I really began to believe that boys were loved more. I think just very early in life, I began to believe a lie that, um, that I wasn't loved as a girl. And everything in life sort of got put through this lens of I should have been a boy. When I was eight years old, I was molested by a boy that was only a year older than me. And that really began to change me. And I became very sexualized. I got into pornography as a like middle school age. And so in high school, I was trying to be more of a girl, be more feminine to get the attention of the boys. But as I did, I began sleeping around a lot and just giving them whatever they wanted. And the more I did that, the more they just treated me like absolute trash. It was after that that I really started to run away from the Lord and I told God that I would never serve him again. And so over the next few years in college, I got more and more into pornography. I started going all over the state just for random sexual encounters that I would find online. And it was like, nothing was satisfying anymore. And so I began to remember all the fantasies I had as a child of feeling like a boy. And I said, that's the problem here. That's why I'm never happy because I was supposed to be the man in the relationship. And I, I hear about this transgender uh, identity. And so I went to a support group meeting and I was amazed that all of a sudden you hear all these people telling me how wonderful this is and how brave I am for coming out. And uh, they said, in a couple of years, no one's ever even gonna know you were a female. I just wanted to be a man and completely forget that I had ever been born female. I really wanted to erase the existence of Laura. I began to transition, I began to take the hormones. And at first it was the greatest thing ever. I was just on cloud nine. I started to begin to grow facial hair and began to grow a beard and sideburns and my voice began to get lower. Even the body shape began to change a little bit. In 2009, I had my name legally changed and uh, eventually later that year, I went to have my chest surgery and had a double mastectomy with a chest reconstruction to look like a male chest. And I thought this was the epitome of everything I'd ever wanted. As I was laying there on the table and I was looking down at my chest before the doctor came in and I could see these purple dotted cut lines where he was gonna cut me open. And I really began to be afraid. And I thought, what if I don't wake up from this? What if I really am in the hands of Satan? Because even in all my times of rebellion, I knew that God was real. And so I just prayed and I asked God to spare my life. After the surgery was over, I quickly forgot God. I forgot my prayer. Even though I was really excited about the results and I liked how it looked physically, I realized that my surgery hadn't made me a man. I was legally a male and I could look down at my license and my birth certificate and it said male. I was still am the same person just without breasts. And that was devastating to me because I really had believed that I would become a man. 
I had hardly talked to my parents in years other than I would call them for an occasional birthday or something like that where I felt obligated. Um, but one day my mom asked me to make a website for her Bible study. And I didn't have any interest in the Bible, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll make a website for you. And as I began to read her notes, I was blown away by what I was reading. In the, and I thought, I have never seen the Bible like this. I had always thought of the Bible as God's rule book. I'm seeing the character and the heart of God. And I began to see a loving and faithful God, not the angry, judgmental God that I had always seen before. I called her one day and I said, Mom, you've got to explain some of this to me. And I was so curious, I called her again the next day and again the next day. And all of a sudden, I went from never talking to her to talking to her every single day. And I would call her after work and I just couldn't wait to talk to Mom at the end of the day. And then one day, um, something had happened and I don't remember what, some kind of crisis had come up in my life. And I'll never forget that day. She said, honey, you just need to trust the Lord. And I was like, I was blown away at that moment because I had never heard my mom say that. And I said, Mom, what has happened to you? You are a totally different person from the one I grew up with. And she had been so radically transformed. And it was at that moment that I knew the gospel was true, that I knew that Christ was alive and that there was a transforming power because I could see how my mom had just been totally changed. And so that night I, I prayed and I asked the Lord into my heart. But I really wanted to be a man of God. And I thought, um, this is great. Now I can find my identity in Christ. But I thought I could still stay as a man because as much as I had realized I couldn't be a man, I could not face being a female. There was so much pain attached because of what all those guys had done, all the lies I had believed all my life. I felt like it was a shameful thing to be a female. But after about a month of just crying out to the Lord, night after night after night, I had a clear vision of Jesus Christ himself getting down on one knee. He reached his hand into the pit and he said, do you trust me? And I remember at that moment thinking, if I take his hand, he's asking me to leave everything. But I knew it was my only way out. I knew I was never going to have peace if I didn't. And so I did, I took his hand, I walked away from my entire identity, my partner, my job, my financial security, the life that I had built for myself and left it all to follow Christ. I, I had made the decision to, to move home. My mom gave me this pile of cards from these women in her Bible study. And I said, Mom, what is this? And she said, these women have been writing cards to you. They're so proud of you. They're so excited to meet you. I looked at these cards and they weren't just signing their name to a nice card. Most of them had poured out their heart to me and told me how they'd been praying for me. And on top of that, they had raised over $1,600 to buy me a new wardrobe. The next morning when I showed up at the Bible study, they surrounded me with more love and joy and hugs than I've ever felt from women in my life. They were so overjoyed at seeing their prayers of years answered. And it was at that moment that I was flooded with love from women and I felt loved as a woman. And it was like that transgender lie just broke and I knew I was not meant to be a man. So many transgenders I know get to a point where they realize the same thing I did, that it's not real. And you keep drifting through life thinking this is the best it's ever gonna get. You have no idea the life that God has for you. You can change your outward appearance, you can change your body, but ultimately you are who God created you to be and you are put on this earth for His purpose. I want others, first of all, to fall madly in love with Jesus and with this faithful, loving God. I think most people have such a wrong perception of God like I did, and they think that God hates them. God loves you more than you could ever even imagine. I just love Laura's heart and passion. She really has lived quite a journey, and her simple message is God loves you. And that is such a powerful truth. I mean, you might think, oh, I know that that's true, but look at Laura's story. Look at her journey of identity. See, she went through an identity crisis, and we all do in many ways, but her specific identity crisis had to do with her gender. And she was reminded that even though she changed her gender on the outside, she said, 
nothing had changed on the inside, and she was faced with this identity question and issue. It was the love of God that drew her to her true self, to her true identity. And, you know, God chooses our gender, and we recognize that there are many people who struggle with their gender and maybe even have a journey of struggling with it. But here's, here's the truth of the matter. God created you. He loves you. He has great value and worth in the gender that he has given you. He wants you to embrace who he designed you to be because he loves you, because his ways are good for you, because they bring joy and fulfillment in life. He's not an angry God or a judgy God or, you know, he knows that we have struggles and even in our own sexuality or gender, it can be a valid struggle for many. But this is what God says to us when, to help us look at ourselves the way God sees us. Romans 12, one and two says it this way, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will is. Will you lay down your gender? Will you lay down your sexuality? Will you lay down the things that have stood between you and God and receive God's love for you and then walk in the way that he has for you because it's good? We'll be right back with more powerful stories from James and other members of the movement. He came home one day from school and he was having a lot of pain in his heart and he started breaking out in what looked like hives because I knew something was seriously wrong with him and it was worse than we had thought. He just spiraled out of control very quickly. And even his face was swelling and he began to throw up violently. And they said, if we don't get him stable, we're in big trouble. The Name of God, available now. Eventually, we went to a part of the city uh, known as Tent City and uh, got to give out care packages and sleeping bags and, uh, again, pray for people and hear their stories, you know. And, and one cool testimony from today is we met a lady. Um, she's living on the streets, so she took a sleeping bag and a care package, and she immediately wanted prayer to be set free from her addiction uh, to fentanyl. And so we, we prayed for her and I just felt led to share my testimony because God rescued me out of addictions as well. And so I shared my story of how God uh, met me and how I discovered my treasure in Jesus and um, how there's no high like the most high, you know, that his love um, is what uh, captivates me now. And so she was really uh, listening, you know, and so uh, after sharing my testimony, I got to share the gospel with her. And she was like, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to make that trade. I'm ready to repent and, and turn to Jesus. And so uh, we led Christine to Jesus today. And so I just want to ask that you guys, uh, those of you watching, would you keep uh, Christine in your prayers? Um, this is just the beginning of a journey. Uh, you know, it doesn't, end, it doesn't stop there just because she prayed to receive Jesus. I mean, that's just the beginning, she needs to be discipled and um, baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and you know, a lot of good things, you know. So um, please continue to pray for Christine and um, for our team as well as we continue to minister to people out on the streets and lead people to Jesus. So God bless you guys and uh, yeah, God's doing great things in this season.
James, I love that so much. You just sharing with us your heart. You're out in the streets doing the real work of the ministry. It's so great. Some people watching might think, oh man, that's James. Like he's a superstar evangelist, you know. What about them? What do you say to people to encourage them to share their faith? Well, I got to say that for me, it really started with reaching people in my sphere of influence, the people that I was in relationship with, that I knew. And so people at my workplace or my neighbors. And so I want to encourage you, start with people in your sphere of influence. It could be at your work. It could be your family, people who don't know Jesus that you know very well, that you're in regular uh, community with. And pray to God to give you an open door and watch how God will respond to your prayers. That's so good. That is so good because, you know, it's we're already in relationship, so let's just be you know, having conversation, right? And I think too, it's surprising how God does give us those words. Yeah. When we're willing and ready. Absolutely. Well, you know, we'd love to have stories from you. James, he's got his camera, he's got his phone on the street. You see all these things we're showing each Friday, those segments. Would you send us, if you have video of stories where you've, you know, prayed with someone or you've led someone to Christ or you've seen something God move in someone's life, send them to us and we'd love to uh, consider to air them on our program. Give us a call, uh, 1-855-759-0700 if you have that or you can send it, the emails on the screen. Pray, we're going to pray for Chris. Please pray for my son who suffers from depression, alcoholism, and epilepsy. Wow. I'll, I'll pray for Chris. Well, we're also going to pray for Mary, for God's leading wisdom and peace, for my friend's upcoming decisions regarding a new relationship. Okay. Well, Father, I want to pray for Chris. I'm praying for Chris's son who is suffering with various ailments. Lord Jesus, I pray the mercy of the Lord Jesus over him. And I just speak against any demonic oppression in Jesus' name, that it would be cast out of him, that you would bring your healing into his life in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. And Father, we pray for Mary's friends. God, we pray for your wisdom. We pray for your direction to be done in their lives regarding their relationship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been great to be with you, James. Thanks for joining us all week. Yeah, this has been so great. Well, you're such an inspiration to us. Oh, and just you. keep going for the kingdom. And thanks for watching Amen. us. Yeah. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.